All right, chapter five is called The Stone Angel. My conversation with Carrie had left me curious and bewildered. As I gazed outside the snow-covered streets, I saw Steve in his driveway brushing snow off his car. It occurred to me that he might have some answers. I ran upstairs to the Christmas box, removed the first letter from it, and scrolled it carefully. Then, stowing it inside the pocket of my overcoat, I quietly slipped out of the house and crossed the street. Steve greeted me warmly. Steve, you've known Mary a long time. Pretty much all my life. There's something I want to ask you about. He sensed the serious tone of my voice and set the brush down. It's about Mary. You know she's like family to us. He nodded in agreement. There seems to be something troubling her, and we want to help her, but we don't know how. Carrie thinks that she might be hiding something. If that's the case, I think that I might have found a clue. I looked down. A little embarrassed by the letter I was holding. Anyway, I found these letters in a box in the attic. I think they're love letters. I was hoping that you could shed some light on this. Let me see, he said. I handed the letter over. He read it, then handed it back to me. They are love letters, but not to a lover. I must have looked perplexed. I think you should see something. I'll be over at Mary's Christmas Eve to visit. I'll take you then. It'll be around three o'clock. It will explain everything. I nodded my approval. That will be fine, I said. I shoved the letter back into my coat, then paused. Steve. Have you ever wondered what the first gift at Christmas was? No. Why do you ask? Just curious, I guess. I walked back to my car and drove off to work. As had become the norm, it was a busy day spent helping brides-to-be match colorful taffeta swatches to formal wear accessories. Choose between ascot or band ties, pleated French cuff shirts with wingtip collars, or plain shirts with colorful ruffled dickies. I had just finished measuring and reserving outfits for a large wedding party. Upon receiving the required cash deposit from the groom, I thanked them for their business, waved goodbye, and turned to help a young man who had stood quietly at the corner waiting my attention. May I help you? I asked. He looked out the counter, swaying uneasily. I need a suit for a small boy, he said softly. He's five years old. Very good, I said. I pulled out a rental form and began to write. Is there anyone else in the party that will need a suit? He shook his head no. Is he to be a ring bearer? I asked. We'd want to try to match his suit to the groom's. No, he won't. I made a note on the form. All right, what day would you like to reserve the suit for? We'd like to purchase the suit, he said solemnly. I set the form aside. That may not be in your best interest, I explained. These young boys grow so fast, I'd strongly suggest that you rent. He just nodded. I just don't want you to be disappointed. The length of the coat cannot be extended, only the sleeves and pant length. He may grow out of it in less than a year. The man looked up at me, initiating eye contact for the first time. We'll be burying him in it, he said softly. The words fell like hammers. I looked down, avoiding the lifeless gaze of his eyes. I'm sorry, I said demurely. I'll help you find something appropriate. I searched through a rack of boy suits and extracted a beautiful blue jacket with satin lapels. This is one of my favorites, I said solemnly. It's a handsome coat, he said. It will be fine. He handed me a paper with the boys' measurements. I'll have the alterations made immediately. It will be ready to be picked up by tomorrow afternoon. He nodded his head in approval. Sir, I'll see that the jacket is discounted. I'm very grateful, he said. He opened the door and walked out, blending in with the coursing river of humanity that filled the sidewalks at Christmas time. As I had spent the morning measuring out seams and checking the availabilities of jackets, Carrie was busy at her own routine. She had fed, bathed, and dressed Jenna, then set to work preparing Mary's brunch. She poached an egg, then topped a biscuit with it, dressed it with a tablespoon of hollandaise sauce. She took the shrieking teapot from the stove and poured a cup of peppermint tea, set it all on a tray, and carried it out to the dining room. She called down the hall. Mary, your brunch is ready. She went back to the kitchen and filled the sink with hot, soapy water and began to wash the dishes. After a few minutes, she toweled off her hands and walked back to the dining room to see if Mary needed anything. The food was untouched. Carrie explored the den, but the Bible lay untouched on its shelf. She checked the hall tree and found Mary's coat hanging in its usual place. She walked down to the bedroom, rapped lightly on the door. Mary, your brunch is ready. There came no reply. Carrie slowly turned the handle and opened the door. The drapes were still drawn closed, and the room lay still and dark. In the bed, she could see the form lying motionlessly beneath the covers. Fear seized her. Mary! Mary! She ran to her side. Mary! She put her hand against the woman's cheek. Mary was warm and damp and breathing shallowly. 
Carrie grabbed the telephone and called the hospital for an ambulance. She looked out the window. Steve's car was still in the driveway. She ran across the street and pounded on the door. Steve opened it, in instantly sensing the urgency on Carrie's face. Carrie, what's wrong? Steve, come quick. Something's terribly wrong with Mary. Steve followed Carrie back to the house and into the room where Mary lay deliriously on the bed. Steve took her hand. Mary, can you hear me? Mary raised a tired eyelid, but said nothing. Carrie breathed a slight sigh of relief. Outside, an ambulance siren wound down. Carrie ran out to meet it and led the attendants down the hall to Mary's room. They lifted Mary into a hammock and carried her to the back of the vehicle. Carrie grabbed Jenna and followed the ambulance to the hospital in Mary's car. I met Carrie and the doctors outside of Mary's hospital room. Carrie had called me at work and I had rushed down as soon as I could. This is to be expected, the doctor said clinically. She has been pretty fortunate up until today, but now the tumor has started to put pressure on vital parts of the brain. All we can do is try to comfort her and make her as comfortable as possible. I know that's not very reassuring, but it's a reality. I put my arm around Carrie. Is she in much pain? Carrie asked. Surprisingly not. I would have expected more severe headaches. She has headaches, but not as acute as most. The headaches will continue to come and go, gradually becoming more constant. Coherency is about the same. She was talking this afternoon, but there's no way of telling how long she'll remain coherent. How is she right now? I asked. She's asleep. I gave her a sedative. The rush to the hospital was quite a strain on her. May I see her? I asked. No, it's best that she sleep. That night, the mansion seemed a vacuum without Mary's presence, and for the first time, we felt like strangers in somebody else's home. We ate a simple dinner with little conversation, then retired early, hoping to escape the strange atmosphere that had surrounded us. But even my strange dreams, to which I had grown accustomed, seemed to be affected. The music played for me again, but its tone had changed to a poignant new strain. Whether it had actually changed or I, affected by the day's events, just perceived the alteration, I don't know. But like the siren song, again it drew me to the Christmas box and the next letter. December 6, 1916. My beloved one, another Christmas season has come, the time of joy and peace, yet how great a void still remains in my heart. They say that time heals all wounds, but even as wounds heal, they leave scars, token reminders of the pain. Remember me, my love. Remember my love. Sunday morning, Christmas Eve, the snow fell wet and heavy and had already piled up nearly four inches by afternoon when Steve met me near the mansion's front door. How's Mary today? he asked. About the same. She had a bad bout of nausea this morning, but otherwise was in pretty good spirits. Carrie and Jenna are still at the hospital with her now. He nodded in genuine concern. Well, let's go, he said sadly. It will be good for you to see this. We crossed the street and together climbed the steep drive to his home. Still unaware of our destination, I followed him around to his backyard. The yard was filled with large cottonwood trees and overground eucalyptus shrubs. It was well secluded by a high stone wall that concealed the cemetery I knew to be behind it. There's a wrought iron gate behind those bushes over there, Steve said, motioning to a hedge near the wall. About 40 years ago, the owner here planted that hedge to conceal the access to the cemetery. He was an older man, didn't like the idea of looking out into it each day. My family moved here when I was 12 years old. It didn't take us boys long to discover the secret gate. We hollowed out the hedge so that we could easily slip into the cemetery from it. We were frequently warned by the sexton never to play in the cemetery, but we did. Every chance we got, we'd spend hours there, Steve confided. It was the ideal place for hide-and-seek. <clears throat> we reached the gate. The paint had chipped and cracked from the cold, rusted steel, but the gate remained strong and well secured. A padlock held it shut. Steve produced a key and unlocked the gate. It screeched as it swung open. We entered the cemetery. One winter, we were playing hide-and-seek about here. I was hiding from my friend when he saw me and started to chase. I ran through the snow up to the east end of the cemetery. It was an area where we never played. One of our friends swore he had heard the wailing of a ghost up there and we decided the place was haunted. You know how kids are. I nodded knowingly as we trudged on through the deepening snow. I ran up through here, he said, pointing to a clump of thick stumped evergreens, then up behind the mausoleum. There, as I crouched behind a tombstone, I heard the wailing. Even muffled in the snow, it was heart-wrenching. I looked up over the stone. There was a statue of an angel about three foot high with outstretched wings. It was new at the time and freshly whitewashed. On the ground before it knelt a woman, her face buried in the snow. She was sobbing as if her heart were breaking. She clawed at the frozen ground as if it held her from something she wanted desperately. 
More than anything, it was snowing that day, and my friend, following my tracks, soon caught up to me. I motioned to him to be quiet. For more than a half hour, we sat there shivering and watching in silence as the snow completely enveloped her. Finally, she was silent, stood up, and walked away. I'll never forget the pain in her face. Just then, I stopped abruptly. From a distance, I could see the outspread wings of the weather-worn statue of an angel. My angel, I muttered audibly. My stone angel. Steve glanced at me imperceptibly. Who was buried there, I asked. Come see, he said, motioning me over. I followed him over to the statue. We squatted down and I brushed the snow away from the base of the monument. Etched in the marble pedestal above the birth and deceased dates were just three words, our little angel. I studied the dates. The child was only three years old, I said sadly. I closed my eyes and imagined the scene. I could see the woman wet and cold, her hands red and snow bitten, and then I understood. It was Mary, wasn't it? His response was slow and melancholy. Yes, it was Mary. The following snow, the falling snow, painted a dreamlike backdrop of solitude around us. It seemed a long while before Steve broke the reverence. That night I told my mother where I had, what I had seen. I thought that I would probably get in trouble. Instead, she pulled me close and kissed me. She said that I should never go back, that we should leave the woman alone. Until now, I never did go back, at least not to the grave. I did come close enough to hear her crying, though. It would tear me up inside. For over two years, she came here every day, even in spring when the pouring rain turned the ground into mud. I turned away from the angel, thrust my hands in my coat pockets, and started back in silence. We walked the entire distance to the house before either of us spoke. Steve stopped at his back porch. The child was a little girl. Her name was Andrea. For many years, Mary placed a wooden box on the grave. It resembles the boxes the wise men carry in nativity scenes. My guess is it's the box you found with the letters. I mumbled a thank you and headed for home alone. I unlocked the heavy front door, pushed it open. A dark silence permeated the mansion. I climbed the stairs to our quarters and then the attic. And for the first time, I brought the Christmas box out into the light. I set it on the hall floor and sat down beside it. In the light, I could see the truly exquisite craftsmanship of the box. The high polish reflected our surroundings and distorted the images, giving a graceful halo to the reflected objects. I removed the last letter. December 6, 1920. My beloved one, how I wish that I might see these things to you, say these things to your gentle face, and that this box might be found empty. Even as the mother of our Lord found the tomb, they placed him in empty. And in this there is hope, my love, hope of embracing you again and holding you to my breast, and this because of the great gift of Christmas, because he came, the first Christmas offering from a parent to his children, because he loved them and wanted them back. I understand that in ways I never understood before, as my love for you has not waned with time, but has grown brighter with each Christmas season. How I look forward to that glorious day that I hold you again. I love you, my little angel, mother. All right, guys, that was chapter five. Do you understand what she has been saying? What was the first gift at Christmas? Well, the first gift was what God gave us, and that's Jesus. So I hope you um, have enjoyed it so far. I'll read chapter six tomorrow, and I think that's the last chapter. Oh, and there's an epilogue, so we have two more. Have a great day.